we're going to talk about what is probably the most important chapter in modern literature in terms of dialogue. This chapter is uh, one of the most fascinating discussions between a captive and his interrogator. You're going to notice a pretty profound metaphysics philosophy discussion going on, and it's really relevant for us today because it's from 1984, and it's a discussion between Winston and O'Brien concerning O'Brien's really malevolent, malicious approach to brainwashing. And you're going to understand that this is really the modus operandi of uh, not just tyrants uh, throughout history, but where we're kind of going today. O'Brien says there uh, are three stages in your integration. There is learning, understanding, and acceptance. It is time for you to enter upon the second stage. As always, Winston was lying flat on his back, but of course his bonds were loose. They were still, they still held him to the bed, but he could not move his knees, only a little. This whole process seems to stretch out over a long time, an indefinite time of weeks, and possibly long intervals, of the sessions that O'Brien was torturing him with. As you lie there, said O'Brien, you have often wondered. You have even asked me why the Ministry of Love should expend so much time and trouble upon you. And when you were free, you were puzzled by what was essentially the same question. You could grasp the mechanics, and essentially, you could grasp the mechanics of society that you lived in, but it was not its underlying motives. Do you remember that writing in your diary you wrote, I understand how, but I don't understand why the system, the establishment is doing what they're doing. It was then that you wrote down about Goldstein's book or parts of it, you said. Did it tell you anything that you did not know already? You have read it, said Winston. I wrote it. That is to say, I collaborated in writing it. No book is produced by any individual in this collectivist dystopian story. Now, this is relevant because the book that Winston is talking about is the book that he read that influenced him to become interested in revolutionary philosophy against Big Brother, against the system. It's called The Theory of Oligarchical Collectivism in the book, and it was written by the supposed uh, rebel figure and revolutionary leader Emmanuel Goldstein, but we come to find out, of course, at this point in the novel, that, a Go that Goldstein is not real. He's an invention as a cutout villain created by O'Brien and Big Brother, and also that the entire book of revolutionary philosophy was, in fact, written by O'Brien. And notice that nothing is produced by individuals in this collectivist society. Everything is produced as a collective of the party. Is it true what it says? As a description, yes. The program it sets forth is nonsense. The secret accumulation of knowledge, a gradual spread of the Enlightenment, ultimately in leading to a proletarian rebellion and the overthrow of the party. <clears throat> Winston is saying, is that real? Brian says, no, that's all nonsense. You foresaw yourself that what what that was what it would say, and it is all nonsense. The proletarians will never revolt. You'll never get the working class to engage in this revolution against the existing order. They cannot revolt. They will not in a thousand years revolt. I have yet I did not tell you the reason. You know it already. If you have ever cherished any dream of violent insurrection, you must abandon it now. There is no way in which the party can be overthrown. The rule of the party is eternal. Make the starting point of your thoughts this. Now that's O'Brien telling Winston that uh, there's no possibility of some sort of revolution. It can't happen. Came closer to the bed forever. And let us now get back to the question of how. Well, what about power? Why does the party cling to power? Winston did not speak for another moment or two, and he felt weariness, and this had overwhelmed him. The faint mad gleam of enthusiasm came back to O'Brien's face. He knew in advance what O'Brien would say. The party did not seek power for its own ends, but only uh, for the good of the majority, so-called. That it might su uh, s that it sought power because men in the mass were actually frail. They were cowardly creatures who could not endure liberty or face the truth, and they must therefore be ruled over syst systemically uh, by 
and deceived by others who were stronger than themselves, that the choice for mankind lay then between freedom and tyranny. And that great bulk of mankind, therefore, was for them happiness, and this happiness was better. The party then was the eternal guardian of the weak, supposedly, a dedicated sect uh, doing evil so that good might come of it, sacrificing its own happiness for that of others. The terrible thing, thought Winston, this terrible thing was that when O'Brien said this, he would believe it. So this is the outer myth that the party has, that Winston believes, that the normies believe about the inner party. However, we're going to find out in an amazing twist that that's not actually the case. <clears throat> You could see it in O'Brien's face. He knew everything <clears throat> a thousand times better than Winston. He knew what the world was really like and in what degradation the mass of human beings lived and by what lies and barbarities the party actually kept them there. He understood all of it. Now notice this is the vantage point of the world social controller type character from Brave New World, Mustafa Mon. This is the vantage point of the uh, social engineer, technocrat kind of, kind of attitude. He had understood it all, he weighed it all, and to him it made no difference. All was justified by the ultimate purpose. What can you do, thought Winston, against this lunatic who is more intelligent than yourself and gives you arguments and a fair hearing and then persists in his lunacy? So this is a bizarre exchange because O'Brien really wants to convince Winston, not just of his position, but show him the madness and gaslight him into his position. Winston says, you are ruling over us for our own good. You believe that human beings are not fit to govern themselves. And therefore, he then cried out. A pain had left, uh, had he shot through his body. O'Brien pushed the pain lever and turned the dial all the way up to 35. You want to keep that pain uh, dial down on about 10. You don't want to get up into the 20s or the 30s. That was stupid. Winston stupid. You would know about you should know better than to say anything like that. He turned the pain lever back on. Now I will tell you the answer to the question. It is this the party seeks power entirely for its own sake. We are not interested in the good of others at all. We are interested solely in power. We don't care about wealth or luxury as long as life or life or happiness. Only power, pure power. Pure power means you will understand. What pure power means, you will understand in this present moment. We are different from all the oligarchs of the past in that we know that what we are doing. All the others, even though that resembled us, be it German socialism, be it Russian communism, all of those came very close in their methodologies. However, they never had the courage to recognize their own motives. They pretended or perhaps even believed that they were working for the common good that perhaps they could create a paradise where men would be equal. It goes on to talk about, again, the previous incarnations of utopian revolutionary philosophy, and maybe many of them actually believed it, O'Brien says. However, we know that no one seizes power with the intention ever of relinquishing it. Power is not a means, it is the end. One makes revolution in order to establish a dictatorship. The object of persecution, then, is persecution. The object of torture is torture. The object of power is power. Now do you begin to understand me, Winston? So we're beginning to see that this is a completely self-referential, malicious situation with O'Brien. And this is, again, why he's one of the greatest villains in all of literature. Winston was instruct by the fact that was struck by this as he had never been struck before the tiredness then that he saw in O'Brien's face you are thinking he says that my face is old and tired you are thinking that I talk of power and yet I'm not even able to prevent my own death the decay of my, my body Winston that the individual is only a cell the weariness of the cell and the vigor uh, of this greater organism then do you die when your fingernails die so he's bringing in this idea of collectivism though he's just a dying cell in a greater organism this calls to mind what we saw in c.s lewis's space trilogy where the demonic entities in, in uh, the third installment want all of mankind to be in a hive mind with no individual identity 
We are the priests of power, he says. <clears throat> God is power, but the present power is only a word so far as you are concerned. Right? So in other words, the party sees itself as God. That's what O'Brien is saying here. It's time for you to gather some idea of what <clears throat> power means. This is the state as God, the state as the party as God. The first thing you must realize is that power is collective. The individual only has power insofar as he ceases to be an individual. So there's the destructive, uh, destruction of the individual, of the person, for the idea of the reintegration into this monistic greater collective. You know that the party has a slogan, freedom is slavery. Has it ever occurred to you that it is also reversible? Slavery is freedom. Alone and free, the human being is defeated. And it must be so because every being is doomed to die which is the greatest of all failures. But if he can make it a complete utter submission, if he can escape from his identity, if he can prepare the way for himself in the party, merge with the party, so that he is in his identity, the party, then he is altogether powerful and therefore immortal. The second thing for you to realize is that power is power over human beings. Hence the, the emphasis in this key chapter on mind control perception management power over uh, human beings then is power over the mind mind control power over matter external reality as you would call it Winston isn't important we don't care about what the objective truth of this or that system or this or that, that theory is no he's saying what we care about is the control of perception and therefore mind control and therefore that is what is our only concern for a moment Winston ignored the dial he made a violent effort to get himself into a sitting position and merely succeeded in wrenching his body painfully well how can you control matter Winston said you don't even control the climate or gravity or disease or pain or death O'Brien silenced him for a moment with his hand talk to the hand we control matter because we control the mind reality is inside of the skull you will learn this by degrees Winston there is nothing that we could not do invisibility levitation anything I could float off this floor like a soap bubble if I wished to but I'm not I do not wish to because the party does not wish it so now you've seen that what would have previously been uh, divine attributes or belief in God has now been transferred to the will of the party. It is divine. <clears throat> you must get rid of all of those 19th century ideas about the laws of nature. We make the laws of nature. No, you don't, said Winston. You're not even masters of this planet. You're not masters of Eurasia or East Asia. You have not conquered them. It does not matter, said O'Brien. We will conquer them whenever it suits us. And if we don't, what difference does that even make? We can shut them out of existence and say that they don't exist. We say that Oceania is the world. So there's even a, an, an, an idea that they control the perceptions of those under their sway so completely that they can just say that something doesn't exist. Continents, other countries, planets, whatever. Does they, they'll, they'll believe whatever they're told is the point of this oligarchical chapter <clears throat> but now wait a minute Winston says the world is just a speck of dust man is a tiny creature he's helpless how long has he even been in existence for millions of years before man the earth was uninhabited nonsense says O'Brien the earth is merely as old as we say it is <laughs> it is no older how could it be older nothing exists through human consciousness now here it starts to sound like O'Brien is believing in solipsism right this this idea that human consciousness makes reality what it is and you might be tempted to think that that's really what winston thinks but we're going to find out that's not actually what o'brien is saying it's even crazier than that but the rocks they have bones of extinct animals winston says there's mammoths there's mastodons there were uh, ancient enormous reptiles dinosaurs dinosaurus rex he says they lived long before man. <clears throat> O'Brien says, uh, really? Have you ever seen those, Winston? Uh, you haven't. 
19th century biologists all invented these things. Before man, there was nothing. After man, and if man comes to an end, there will then be nothing also. Outside man, there is nothing. But the whole universe is outside of man, said Winston. Look, there's stars. There's millions of light years away. Uh, they don't even reach out. Uh, they don't even reach us for, out for forever. They are out of our reach for forever. Excuse me. What are stars, said O'Brien? They are bits of fire a few kilometers away. The earth is the center of the universe. The sun and the stars go around it. In other words, he can, he's basically saying that people will believe the cosmology, the geography, the geopolitical systems, the, the very nature of reality itself will be determined by what these people dictate. And that's really how the world is attempting to be run right now. The people who run the world really operate this way. They decide they're going to tell you what exists and what doesn't exist. They're going to play God. They will decide who lives and who dies. And so this O'Brien metaphysics discussion helps us to understand and get an give us an understanding, understand the attitude of the social engineers. For certain purposes, of course, this is all not true. When we navigate the ocean or when we predict an eclipse, we often find it convenient to assume that the earth goes around the sun or that there are millions and millions of stars uh, millions of miles away. But so what? Do you suppose that it is beyond us to produce a dual system of astronomy? We could come up with a whole other system, he says, and enforce that on the public is what he's saying. The stars can be said to be near or distant, whatever we need them to be. Do you think that our mathematicians are not up to that? Have you forgotten the notion of doublethink? Remember, in the novel, doublethink is the idea that the system can enforce and command the masses, the population, to hold within their head two completely contradictory notions at the same time, and the masses are okay with that. Winston shrank back upon the bed, and he said to himself, well, what? Whatever he said, the swift answer, excuse me, would be crushed like a bludgeon. And yet he knew, he knew deep down that he was in the, in the right here. The belief that nothing exists outside your own mind, uh, he says, wasn't this exposed a long time ago? It's some kind of fallacy, he thought. And he tried to remember. And then he said, I told you, Winston, the metaphysics of, th th that metaphysics is not your strong point. Ironic statement there. The word is that you're trying to think of, the word you're trying to think of is called solipsism. However, you're mistaken. What I am proposing, Winston, is not solipsism. It is rather collective solipsism, if you like. But that's a different thing. In fact, it is the opposite of that. But all this is a digression. In other words, it's not what you as an individual or my uh, individual mind as O'Brien conjures up that determines what's reality. Reality is determined by the collective consensus of the party because to determine reality is the power of God and that's the power that the party wants to and claims to have in the novel all this is a digression the power we have to fight for night or today is not the power over things but it is power over men that matters that is control Winston thought by making man suffer Exactly. Here we're going to get to the important section that is a profound insight into psychological warfare. Obedience is not enough, Winston. If Unless man is suffering, how can you be sure that he has, the, uh, that his obedience is under your will and that he is not, and he doesn't have, still have his own will? Power is in inflicting pain and humiliation. Power is in treating human minds and tearing them to pieces and then putting them back together again in new shapes of your own choosing again mind control destroying and fracturing the mind tearing down the individual and his persona his personality and then restructuring the individual into the kind of being that the state god or the technocratic elite want do you not begin to see then what kind of world that we are creating winston it is the exact opposite of the stupid hedonistic utopias that the old reformers imagined. A world of fear and a world of treachery, torment, etc. Right? These are the things. 
torment and treachery. These are all <clears throat> the old way of doing things. A world of trampling and being trampled upon, however, is the world that we will instantiate, he says. And he says, progress in our world will be only progress towards more and more pain. Old civilizations claim that they were founded on love and justice. Ours will be founded upon hate. Everything will be about destruction. Everything will be about breaking down the habits which came before. Everything will be about the revolution. We get a clear idea of this in Brave New World, especially when we look at the introductory chapter that Huxley wrote where he said that the final revolution is a revolution against man himself to overcome human nature being a post-human world. And so no longer will there be free associations, no longer will there be any freedom at all. It will be a world of complete and total slavery, a satanic aeon, which I've covered in previous talks. That is identical to what O'Brien is talking about bringing in here. Sexual distinctions and natural offspring and procreation will be completely eradicated. It will not exist. The only loyalty that will exist is loyalty to the party. The only love that will exist is love towards Big Brother. There will be no art. There will be no literature. There will not be sciences. There will not be a distinction between the beautiful and the ugly. There will not be curiosity. There will not be a process of life. There will not be competing competing pleasures. All of this will be destroyed. Always at every moment, there will be the thrill of the victory and the sensation of trampling upon humanity as an enemy who is helpless. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on the human face for all of eternity. Here we can see the satanic, angelic, demonic hatred of human nature and human beings completely incarnate, completely instantiated in the figure of O'Brien. Remember that this will be like, that this will be forever, Winston. The face of a human will always be there just to be trampled upon. The heretic, the enemy of society, will be man himself, in other words. He will be humiliated over and over and over. So it's a ritual humiliation, something that we've talked about as part of the process of mind control and psychological warfare. Everything that you have understood since you have been in our hands will continue and it will only be worse. The espionage, the betrayal, the arrest, the torture, execution, the disappearances, none of this will ever cease. In a word, it will be a world of T-E-R-R-O-R as much as a world of triumph. But only the party is powerful. The party is not tolerant. The weaker the opposition, the tighter the despotism. Goldstein and his heresies, however, will live forever because there always needs to be a opposition, a controlled opposition to trample upon, he says. Every day at every moment, they will always be in perpetual defeat. They will be discredited. They will be ridiculed, spat upon. This will be a cyclical cycle, right? It's like a flat circle just going around and around. It's like Nietzsche's flat circle. And old Goldstein's just getting trampled on. Oh, Winston's over there getting trampled on for all eternity, right? Little Matthew McConaughey has to step in here and help us understand. Matthew McConaughey. You will accept it. You will uh, love all of this, Winston. You will be made to love your own torture. Now, I think this is why we see so much of the elite and the, especially the really sick, degenerate elite involved in very degrading and even bizarre leather types of uh, activities if you know what I mean because it fits exactly with what O'Brien is talking about the demonic hatred of humanity and Winston goes on to say this is impossible this would disintegrate it would fall apart and then he goes on to say that life will not overcome because we control life Winston at all levels you're beginning to understand that there is something called human nature And it will be outraged by what we do, and it will even turn against us. But remember that we create, through perception, human nature. He's not saying that they literally create human nature. He's saying that what human nature is perceived to be is dictated by the social engineers and these technocrats. So all they have to do is alter people's perception of each other and human nature. And then the process can continue, he says. Men are infinitely malleable. 
we can create human nature. Just say it's something new, he's saying. He says, the masses are like animals. They're helpless. But the humanity itself, human nature, is the party. And they will dictate reality and what nature is, what human nature is. Do you believe in God, Winston? No, says Winston. Then what is it? This principle that will defeat us, Winston. I don't know. It is the spirit of man. Well, do you consider yourself to be a man? Yes, I do, said Winston. If you are a man, Winston, you're the last man. For your kind is extinct. Now, notice that Winston, Winston's folly here is that he's an atheist. And part of the the redeeming quality of this book, I guess you could say, because it does have a very kind of dark, negative view, because as we know, Winston doesn't succeed. But Winston is an atheist, so perhaps part of the message here is that atheism and revolutionary Marxism, right, which is partly what Orwell is critiquing here, will never succeed against the existing control structure. And in fact, we learn that Marxism, socialism are a false dialectic basically run by people like O'Brien. I mean, if you want to understand the meaning of this, the section, the usage of revolutionary philosophy, Orwell is telling us that the socialist Marxist revolutionaries embodied in the figure of O'Brien they are run by the establishment they are establishment characters that they're claiming to oppose you see that's very important o'brien did not speak uh after winston said well i feel myself to be superior two other voices spoke out after a moment, Winston recognized one of them as his own. It was a soundtrack of the conversation they'd had in the past because he had been surveilled and recorded. This was on the night when he enrolled himself in the Brotherhood, this idea of right, this revolutionary group. He heard himself promising to lie, to steal, to forge, to murder, and to encourage drug taking and prostitution to disseminate diseases or to throw vitriol in a child's face, whatever was necessary to be part of the Brotherhood. <clears throat> And this was to show Winston that he really was no better than anyone else, like he thought. You are the last man. You are the guardian of the human spirit. And you shall see yourself as you are. Now take off your clothes. And then he proceeds to you know, continue to humiliate him. He really has a hatred, a demonic hatred of the human body. And um, the torture continues. He says, you are a filth bag, <laughs> bag of filth. Uh, now turn around and look in the mirror. Do you see yourself, last man? You're the last human. You are a filth bag. We have beaten you, Winston. So he, he continues to berate him and drag him down. And Winston says, tell me, O'Brien, how soon will it be till they shoot me? It might be a long time. You're a very difficult case. But don't give up hope. Everything is cured sooner or later. In the end, we will shoot you. <laughs> and of course, we know that you know as it, the, the, no, the novel progresses, Winston is integrated he is processed into the system and returns presumably then again to be killed at some point whenever the party determines now hope you get an idea then of the attitude and of the spirit with which our oligarchical collectivist rulers rule over us and that systems that are materialistic and atheistic are never going to be real solutions to the revolution that we are living under now, which is the post-human, anti-human revolution. Remember, too, that one way to fight this system is not just through the spiritual uh, aspects of finding God and so forth, all of which is very important, but there's also things that you can do to improve your health, right? right? The spirituality, obviously, that comes first, but I would say if you want to improve your health, what you want to do is uh, engage in supplementation and my show sponsor, of course, is Chalk.com, which is an excellent company. If you're looking to just get overall boosts to your uh, nutrient-deficient diet, we almost all have nutrient-deficient diets nowadays, I would say start with something like the Chalk Daily. Uh, if you're looking for mental clarity, I would say look for something like the Ashwagandha or the Shilajit. Those are excellent, especially for people on keto carnivore diets. If you're looking to just boost your energy levels, I would say try out the Action 2.0. If you're looking for actual... Um, testosterone boosting 
supplements, I would say get the Toncat Ali. That's actually proven in multiple peer-reviewed studies to actually boost testosterone. So you can go over to chalk.com and you can put in the promo code J50, J-A-Y-5-0, and that will give you 50% off any of the orders that you put in. But if you're looking for recurring orders, which is actually better than just a single order, you get a little better discount. You have to put in J53LIFE, J53LIFE, L-I-F-E, and that will give you a little bit of a bigger discount on those recurring subscriptions. All their products are 100% organic adaptogens. They have the most strict, stringent process when it comes to uh, where they extract these, these supplements especially when it comes to the rainforest sourcing that they do. So all their products come directly from the rainforest. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of chalk. Been, do, been doing it for uh, about seven, eight, nine months now. And um, I would never go off or back to any other, any other supplementation product. So I'm a big fan of supplements. Been taking them for many years. And these are definitely the best. So get yourself on over the, there to chalk.com and check them out right now.